Hi, I'm James Naylor Green, Professor of Brazilian History and Culture at Brown University and the National Co-Coordinator of the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil. This program is part of the Democracy Observatory and is supported by the Washington Brazil office. This is Brazil Unfiltered. Today I have the pleasure to speak with Jana Silverman. Jana holds a PhD in labor economics from the Universidade Estadual de Campinas and is a postdoctoral scholar at the Center for Global Workers' Rights at Penn State University. She is also a research fellow at the Washington Brazil office. She is also a researcher with the Center for Trade Union Studies and Econ the Economy of Labor at the Economics Institute of the State University of Campinas. Her research interests include Latin American labor relation regimes, contemporary Brazilian political economy, and domestic workers. In addition, she is co-chair of the America Subcommittee of the Democratic Socialists of America International Committee. Previously, she was a program director for Brazil of the Eva Vel CIO Solidarity Center in Sao Paulo from 2012 to 2020. Welcome, Jana, to Brazil Unfiltered. Thanks, Jim. It's so great to be here. Looking so, forward to this conversation. So, Jana, tell us first of all, how did you get involved in Brazil? Okay, so there, it's a bit of a long story. So I've been uh, doing kind of Latin America solidarity work for now, I want to say two and a half decades. Uh, you know, I was a labor activist, a rank and file labor activist, then a shop steward uh, in New York with UAW back as one of my first jobs after I finished my undergrad degree. I was always very interested in labor. I come out of a labor family. I uh, was always a labor activist, also have been very inclined to socialist politics. Uh, and I, you know, through meeting other folks, uh, other activists in New York, Latino activists, I found out that, you know, uh, unionists in other countries, including Colombia and in Brazil, Guatemala, have been heavily persecuted for things that, you know, in the United States I did with, you know, without fear of, you know, uh, without fear of, without, without worrying about, you know, uh, threats to my lives, but you know the maximum that could happen, obviously, as a labor as a labor activist in the United States, is basically you can get fired. Uh, but anyway, I found out about uh, we got involved in activism first with the Colombian trade movement, uh, trade trade union movement. I moved to Medellin and worked for five years as a labor researcher with an institute that's linked to the primary uh, union confederation of, of uh, Colombia, also called the CUT. Uh, and what during that time as a researcher, I got involved with a pan Latin American project that researched uh, the labor impacts of certain multinational enterprises. And the organization that was leading that project was the Instituto Observatorio Social of the CUT Brazil. So it was, I want to say it was the end of 2005. I went to Sao Paulo for the first time and I just fell in love, fell in love. We met so many great friends that I'm still friends with today. Uh, you know, just really, uh, absolutely was intrigued by sort of the whole political process that was happening at the time with, you know, this was the first Lula government, seeing the labor movement have real power, uh, having really being able to influence national politics, which is something obviously I didn't see in Colombia, uh, all to the contrary, trade unions were getting assassinated in Colombia at the same time. And even we didn't see that, or we don't see that even today that much in the United States. Uh, so just was became really fascinated, made some very deep friendships and just start learned Portuguese. And when it came time to uh, when I wanted to make a bit of a career shift uh, and decided I wanted to go do a PhD and wanted to do it in labor economics, I decided since I was going to study Latin America and study the Brazilian labor movement, what better place to do it than to go actually go and do it in Brazil at the University of Campinas, which has a, a very well known sort of heterodox uh, labor economics program. So I went there and after finishing my degree, I basically just stayed. <laughs> I was lucky enough to find a job there and uh, would hope to be able to move back there soon. And you have possible. a son who's a Brazilian American, is that right? Yeah, my son, I have a five and a half year old. He was born in Sao Paulo uh, in Villa Mariana. Uh, his dad is actually from uh, Volta Redonda, Rio de Janeiro, but uh, we met him in Sao Paulo. And so he's got two passports and I'm still happy to have my Brazilian permanent residence. So I definitely feel partially Brazilian myself. So um, what's the state of the labor movement in Brazil today? Well, the labor movement in Brazil has been going through some very difficult times that didn't necessarily begin just with Bolsonaro. Um, uh, obviously, it went through sort of its heyday. Uh, well, sort of its first heyday was back in the uh, mid early to mid 80s, where 
Uh, you had the Novo Syndicalismo movement, which was the, the, the new form of unionism that was anti-corporativist, you know, that believed in freedom of association, more rank and file oriented, which Lula came out of, you know, he's the most uh, sort of well-known figure. Uh, and then after fighting off a series of neoliberal reforms under Fernando Henrique Cardoso in the 90s, uh, you know, obviously with the PT governments, the union movement uh, was afforded a lot of new spaces, you know, that they participated in a lot of, you know, multi-partite consejos on social policy, on labor policy. Um, there was uh, the, you know, massive increases in the real minimum wage. Uh, there was a uh, very important legislation which uh, increased the uh, dramatically increased rights for domestic workers. Uh, so it was a good, it was, it was, you know, obviously it was a good moment for labor, but at the same time, sort of my criticism is that they didn't use that time uh, as much as they probably could have in terms of to increase their actual membership, to build stronger links with their rank and file. And so when you start to see these attacks coming from the right wing, uh, you know, as there's an economic downturn starting in you know, 2014 or so, uh, you know, they basically, uh, because of the lack of these connections with a lot of rank and file members and with the Brazilian working class in general, they weren't able to mobilize a substantial number of, of Brazilian workers to defend the gains under the PT governance. And that's what we saw the coup in 2016. And the coup uh, against uh, the constitutional coup against Dilma Rousseff, which, uh, you know, obviously one of the main reasons for the elites was to implement the neoliberal economic policies. And one of the first, and I would say one of the most harshest was the labor law reform of 2017, which introduced a huge number of new forms of precarious contracting, which uh, reduced labor rights, uh, reduced union rights in terms of the role unions play in monitoring workers' contracts. Uh, and perhaps most importantly for the labor movement, they lost their primary source of financing, which was the labor union tax, which uh, every worker, every formal sector worker in Brazil used to pay one year, one day's worth of salary per year to unions. And that was their form of, of uh, financing. And so they lost that. And then basically since then, uh, they've been really struggling to find new forms of financing. And then obviously having Lula in prison for almost two years, you know, kind of gave them a loss of social and political legitimacy because Lula is so identified with the labor movement. Uh, and, you know, again, the whole spiral of fake news, I'm sure many of your other uh, guests have talked about, you know, the whole impact of the 2018 elections, but that was very, very, uh, that was very, uh, felt very deeply by labor. And since then, you know, obviously then after, you know, Bolsonaro coming to power, you have him trying to take a series of other measures uh, through medidas provisorias or like, uh, uh, you know, constant, you know, presidential decrees to make it even more difficult for labor to organize, such as uh, not allowing unions anymore to do dues checkoff. So basically let employer make it have employers uh, take out dues money from members directly from paychecks. Uh, there was a space about three months where actually anybody who wanted to pay dues, the unions actually had to do it through depositing money in a bank account. Uh, which is obviously very difficult. Many people, as much as they may be union supporters, will not go out of their way to do something like that. And then obviously when the pandemic came, there was a whole nother slew of presidential decrees that Bolsonaro made to limit collective bargaining, to flexibilize work contracts even more using the pandemic as a pretext. Luckily, many of these medidas provisorias have not stood. Uh, they were not voted on favorably afterwards by the Congress. Uh, but we're still back at, you know, not back at square one, but we're still at this sort of negative square one, which is the labor movement uh, post labor law reform 2017. So I guess that would be kind of the short version. <laughs> so what's at stake in the 2022 elections for labor? A lot, absolutely a lot. Uh, you know, again, there's I don't, th there's definitely a hope that some of these worst provisions of the labor law reform, which allow for, for example, zero hour contracts, which are a very extreme form of part-time contracts where work workers get contracted, but they are guaranteed that they have, they will actually, they're not guaranteed they'll get any actual hours to work. Uh, so they're not guaranteed to make a minimum wage. Wait, wait a minute, uh, I don't understand that. Why, do, why, why does that happen? An employer wants to guarantee a person is at their beck and call when they might need them? Exactly. And this is actually a contract, you know, it, it's not that dissimilar, you know, from the way many part time contracts work in the United States, you know, you get your many part time contracts, you're hired 
but not with any sort of fixed number of hours per se. And this is something we're seeing playing out, you know, it's kind of apprentices with the Starbucks workers in the United States, which are organizing many of the uh, key organizers, they can't get, they shouldn't get fired because that's against US labor law. But what the company is doing them is giving them little to no hours. But there's so again, there's a kind of contract now in Brazil uh, that 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 functions like that. Uh, that's hope unions are hoping to overturn that. They're basically hoping to, you know, get a seat at the table again, you know, for obvious reasons, Bolsonaro has no channels of negotiation with the unions at all. Um, They've been persecuted, you know, especially rural unions. There's been cases of assassinations of union leaders since 2018. Uh, so again, it's really a question of uh, this election will really depend on their sort of physical and political existence. So in the past, um, during the dictatorship, when it was finally allowed for there to be national labor federations that existed, two major ones came to be. One of them was the Central Unified uh, central unity, or how, how is Kuchi translated into English? I'm trying to remember. Unified Workers Central, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and which was the one that was affiliated with the Workers Party, and there was another uh, large uh, confederation. And over the years, there are I think now seven national confederations. At, uh, my understanding is that they're all supporting Lula in this election. Is that the case? And if that is the case, what, how did that happen? Well, all except one, one that's relatively small, which is the CSB, uh, which is now looks like they are supporting Ciro Gomes. Uh, but all the major labor confederations, which are the Cuchi, the Forza Sindical, uh, and the UGT, which is usually a pluralist central, which usually doesn't take a political position, they are all supporting Lula. Because again, the unions have been so hard hit that uh, they realize that their only way that they can have any kind of impact is getting you know somebody a little bit more friendly in power. And obviously, any continuation, any re-election of Bolsonaro will be absolutely tragic, not just for the unions, but for the entire Brazilian working class. I mean, we've had we're we're looking at record unemployment, you know, record levels of subemployment, which means people are not can't find jobs, but given the, the number of hours that they need to work in order to have an income to survive. I mean, just the whole, all the gains that were made under the PT government in terms of like uh, fighting poverty, et cetera, have all been completely rolled back. And so again, I think it's just uh, you know, even though I think the unions, for example, don't have this expectation that Lula will bring the union tax back, but they know that they will have a seat at the table again under a Lula government. They'll even have a chance that they'll have a revamped labor ministry. You know, again, remember Bolsonaro eliminated completely the labor ministry for the first two and a half years of his administration. So there was no channel of institutional dialogue whatsoever. Uh, union issues were divided up into the justice ministry, which at the time was Sergio Moro, you know, not a labor fan. And then the other part of issues related to labor were in the economics ministry. Again, Paulo Guedes, never a friend of labor. So uh, again, it's this expectation that, you know, Lula will, will be able to open channels of dialogue, create institutional spaces, uh, again, Lula being sort of this master of social dialogue, you know, by excellence, I think uh, that's, that's and, and he's been dialoguing with all the centrals uh, individually. And so I think that's another reason why they've all been able to come together or 90% in favor of the Lula candidacy or pre-candidacy, we could say. So, Jana, you worked uh, in Sao Paulo with the Solidarity Center, which is linked to the AFL CIO, the largest uh, labor federation in the United States. Uh, I was a member of the AFL-CIO when I was a member of Service Employees International Union many years ago, and also the Communication Workers of America as a labor activist after I left Brazil and lived, going back to the United States. What exactly is the Solidarity Center? So the Solidarity Center, again, it's linked to the AFL-CIO, but has its own bylaws and, you know, it's, it's technically its own uh, organization. It's the sort of uh, labor solidarity, labor cooperation, it's, how could we say it? International Cooperation Institute for the American Labor Movement. So the Solidarity Center has about 40 offices all around the world uh, in Latin America. In addition to Sao Paulo, they have offices in Bogota, Colombia, in Guatemala, in, 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 in Mexico City, uh, Lima, Peru. 
uh, where they do work, you know, they get funds, sometimes government funds, sometimes other uh, private foundation funds or other resources to apply and do joint product projects with, uh, you know, union partners, uh, generally unions that are also affiliated to uh, the, the International Confederation of Labor to which the AFL-CIO is affiliated, which is the ITUC, International Trade Union Confederation. So, you know, the main Brazilian centrals, uh, UGT, Cuchi, Force are all uh, ITUC affiliates. Uh, so especially Cuchi, you know, has this sort of historical relationship with the AFL-CIO. Uh, so they've been, you know, a lot of our projects in terms of, you know, our cooperation projects were with the Cuchi, you know, working on strengthening women's empowerment in unions, uh, fighting, uh, uh, fighting racial inequality at the workplace, uh, and then we did obviously a very big project, which is very dear to my heart uh, with domestic workers and, you know, trying to strengthen domestic worker unions. So those are just a sample of some of the projects we did. We also did projects looking at uh, human rights and the legacy of the dictatorship and human rights abuses against uh, unionists. Uh, we supported some of the work of the Comissão Nacional de Verdade. Uh, the CUD had its own Comissão, uh, had, had its own special truth commission also. Uh, so yeah, we, we did a lot of interesting work. And because of that job, I was able to kind of live in, in my own skin, that whole process of the decline of, you know, union rights and decline of democracy, because I was in that position from 2012, you know, a relatively good time for unions until the middle of the pandemic in 2020. So. Mm. so when I was in Sao Paulo at the University of Sao Paulo doing my master's, I had chosen the topic of researching the American Institute for Free Labor Development which was founded in 1961 in the midst of the Cold War with strong support of the AFL-CIO. And its purpose at the time was to really um, fight against communist influence in the trade union movement. Um, it was supported by multinationals who had large investments in Brazil, the US government, and likely CIA money. So um, I never finished my master's dissertation because I couldn't get access to any of the key people or the researcher, uh, the documents. But many years later, one of my uh, a Brazilian student who came to Brown, uh, Larissa Correa, did a book on, on this topic. So we all know that the US government was involved in the 1964 coup, helped overthrow it. And probably some of these labor figures, they at least boasted that they were involved in, in the coup's success in 1964. So what was it like for you as a progressive, pro-socialist North American, working with an institution in which had a history in its past being involved in undemocratic measures. Um, how did you negotiate that? Or how did the Solidarity Center negotiate that, that history? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I would say I would start off, you know, the sort of the foreign policy of the AFL-CIO sort of has a before and after, you know, the, 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 the point which marked the difference was, you know, 1995, when the with the election of John Sweeney on the reform slate, you know, defeating sort of these old guard, very sort of rooted in Cold War politics leadership, you know, uh, that 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 came before, uh, and after that, it was I think I believe in 1998 is when the new version of their foreign policy body, which is now called the Solidarity Center, kind of was formally constituted with new bylaws, with a new you know. Uh, board of directors, new, you know, new, not entirely new staff, but mostly new staff. That's where, you know, the new staff was came on board, for example, in the Brazil office, you know, it changed names, you know, everything. Uh, and, you know, as a progressive, you know, kind of, there was a sort of cleaning of the slate, you know, understanding that, understanding that, you know, it is important to have American unionists on the ground, you know, working uh, side by side to assist our union brothers and sisters. Uh, the union movement by definition believes in international solidarity and, and you know, it's a practice that uh, the union movement has lived since its inception in the, you know, uh, in the 19th century. So I think it is very important for, for you know, American labor, which can have access to resources, financial resources, power resources, uh, you know, even their own connections with multinational enterprises, for example, uh, 
to help our brothers and sisters in the global south. And, you know, in my case in Brazil, you know, I kind of reasoned, you know, if 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 the salary center isn't using some of this money, which is basically taxpayer money, it could get used to, for much worse pur purposes, you know? So I feel like, you know, the 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 institution, although there it is a legacy, I think it's a legacy that the uh, American labor movement should still recognize, you know, and think about is there are ways of reparations, for example, you know, I think in my own head, the one way of kind of working towards that form of reparations is doing projects, for example, on human rights with our Brazilian counterparts. Uh, so that's how I kind of justified it, you know. Yeah, and it's also really important to point out that um, in, in 1981, Lula was indicted under the National Security Act during the dictatorship. And there was a huge outpouring of support among the labor movement in the United States Lula came to the United States and met with AFL-CIO in Washington, D.C., and built strong links with people like Stan Gasek, who's also a member of the Washington Brazil office, and, and others. And so that really shifted. And part of that, in my mind, had to do with the fact that in the 80s in the United States, a lot of young ex-students like yourself went into the labor movement. Many of them were involved in Central American Solidarity or South African anti-apartheid work. And that kind of changed the tone of the labor movement in the United States. So I can see that shift and I can see the part of that that you have been involved in. So tell us a little bit more about your research and your work with domestic workers in Brazil. That's a very interesting topic. Yeah, well, uh, so sort of the way I got involved in the topic was again, it was, you know, we had the possibility a salary center of getting some specific resources to do uh, a large project. You know, it was never a sector I'd really engaged with very much. But, uh, you know, once I started getting to know more about it, I just, uh, you know, got really fascinated because, again, the, the domestic work, you know, just like farm work in Brazil is, a, you know, a direct, hey, you know, legacy of slavery, you know, the, uh, the way that, you know, the domestic workers were excluded from all or all, almost all, of, you know, the vast majority of labor protections, you know, they were not included in the 1943 uh, labor code, but you know that was written by Getulio Vargas, which was progressive for its time. Uh, they only gradually started getting a few labor protections here and there. Ironically, that first started under the military dictatorship in the in the 1970s. But then it wasn't until uh, then they were allowed to finally form unions of, because before then they could only form associations. Uh, so under they were allowed to form unions starting with the uh, Constitution of 1988. Uh, so you have the first official domestic worker unions uh, forming then, even though, again, before you have this whole history of domestic worker associations uh, that go back to the late 1930s. Uh, the first one was formed in the, the city of Santos uh, by uh, an activist uh, called Laudelina de Campos Melo, who was uh, actually also a member of the Communist Party, a very amazing individual, you know, who stayed involved with the domestic worker union movement for entire life, you know. Uh, anyway, so you have these unions starting to form, but, and then they start working together. They take advantage of this, again, this political opening that happens, you know, during the PT governments. Uh, to win some really impressive legislation, you know, which almost, you know, 90% now they have the same rights as all any other private worker. And that's basically, you know, in the case of Brazil, as you probably know, that that's pretty revolutionary. You're talking about 6 million, uh, you know, 6 million workers, you know, a huge, uh, Brazil has the largest amount of domestic workers in the world outside of India. 94% uh, of them are women close to 63% are Afro-Brazilian. Uh, and even with these labor protections, you still have, you know, uh, less than 50% actually earn at least the minimum wage. You know, only 40% contribute or are covered under the social security system of Brazil. You know, so again, you have the most vulnerable population, you know, sort of the real base of the, the pyramid, base of the labor market pyramid. But at the same time, you have these women, these black women with low levels of education who, you know, really experience enormous difficulties in their life, you know, doing amazing organizing, organizing that some of these traditional unions are not capable of doing, you know, and these are workers, again, they have little no free time. They have no paid staff for their unions. You know, they rely, they, they don't even have, most of them don't even have their own offices. They rely on like church basements to be able to meet in places like that. But at the same time, you know, they've been able to really empower and dignify, you know, so many domestic workers around the country. And, and I really, 
you know, it's it's really been an, an amazingly gratifying experience to, you know, be able to share and, and support their struggle and, and learn from their experiences. One of the things that I think our viewers and listeners who might not know uh, Brazil as well as you do is that every middle class family had at least one uh, domestic worker, uh, a maid, if not more. And today they certainly have at least a cleaning lady coming in several days a week or a cook. Uh, but this was the basis of labor, uh, of domestic labor in the United States, in, in Brazil, in the household was, was this massive numbers of people. So what were the kinds of specific changes that happened with the new labor, labor legislation as a result of the, the organizing of, of domestic workers? So first of all, you had to start paying domestic workers overtime. They had, they were, they had to have by law, you know, one full day off. Uh, they had to get over, you know, they had to get extra overtime, for example, to work Sundays and holidays. Uh, they were finally allowed to uh, collect unemployment insurance. And even today, they don't, they don't collect as many months of unemployment insurance as other private sector workers, but it's still something, right, you know. Uh, they get, uh, they also get certain other benefits that, like the FGTS, which is a, another benefit that you receive if you're unemployed or if you want to use it uh, for, you know, to purchase housing, things like that. Um, and so basically, again, it's just that, you know, it, it was the possibility uh, for workers to come in and, you know, be able to look their employer eye to eye and say, you know, we have the same rights. Because again, like you just said, you know, people, most people who employ domestic workers in Brazil are not super rich people like they are in the United States who have, you know, live in maids. But, you know, like you said, almost every middle class family has a domestic worker, you know. I myself, you know, with my son, we had an amazing nanny who I also like to say, you know, became a union activist and now is a leader of the Sao Paulo, <laughs> Sao Paulo <laughs> domestic worker unions. Uh, so, yeah. It, so, again, it's this idea of like equality, you know, dignity, you know, like people really, you know, you get uh, more workers are now they can have maternity leave. They have protections against firing, you know, if they get pregnant, you know, you uh, and then there's a specific case, the city of Sao Paulo, the, the domestic worker union in Sao Paulo actually has a collective bargaining agreement, which they've been able to sign, negotiate and sign since 2016, which gives additional protections. You know, they have a minimum wage that sort of the wage floor is higher than the national minimum wage. Um, they get other kinds of benefits in terms of access to insurance and other kinds of social programs. And they have a very interesting clause also for uh, immigrant domestic workers because uh, Sao Paulo has been more and more you've seen, it, it used to be that you get a lot of immigrant domestic workers from immigrants from other parts of Brazil going to Sao Paulo to work. Nowadays, you actually have international immigrants, whether it's from you know other Latin, South American countries like Bolivia, Peru, or also uh, now you have for, from Haiti, from, uh, Portuguese speaking African countries like Angola and sort of the high level, uh, you know, domestic workers, nannies, you have now an influx of domestic workers from Philippines because you have this uh, tendency among the elite to want to have nannies that speak English. And so now there's been this whole, you know, uh, wave of, of Filipino domestic workers coming in, obviously in there. And, and so basically now the Sao Paulo domestic worker unions have been uh, they have specific organizing campaigns for uh, immigrant domestic workers, you know, in their languages also, and they have a clause which uh, guarantees, you know, equality of rights for, you know, Brazilian born domestic workers, as well as their immigrant counterparts and gives immigrant workers uh, paid time off if they need to go and, you know, deal with things related to their migration status. So those are some of the few of the of the uh, sort of big advances both the Sao Paulo Union and the workers in general have been able to achieve. When I uh, traveled with uh, uh, Jimma Hussefi on a tour in the United States in 2017, she told me the story that one of the underlying really strong negative sentiments towards her government was the fact that she under her government, they signed additional labor laws to protect domestic workers. And many, many people of the upper class and the upper middle class, and even the middle class were very angry because they really had lost the equivalent of contemporary slavery or slave labor in their homes. And they had to pay people a decent wage and rights. And it really angered uh, these wealthy women or wealthy families that kind of lost that privilege uh, to the labor organizing. 
So I understand you're organizing a delegation of people from uh, the Democratic Socialists of America to Brazil. Uh, could you tell us a little about that? Yeah, so, you know, again, DSA, DSA is an organization. It's the largest left-wing organization in the United States. We have close to 100,000 dues-paying members. Uh, many, the, the vast majority of our members are, are very young, you know, their 20s and 30s, many people who were inspired to become active in politics uh, with the Bernie Sanders free campaigns in 2016 and 2020. And so we feel like we have a lot to learn from our counterparts in Brazil, especially the PT. You know, we've been developing uh, relationships with the PT International Relations Secretary and other PT members, uh, and they invited us to come. Uh, it was originally supposed to be earlier in the year, but then there was the whole Omicron business, and we decided to kind of push it off. And we are going to be we're going to be there for May Day, uh, and so it'll be really exciting to it'll be the first in person May Day since 2019, since I, the last two years there's been a pandemic, uh, so it's just going to be a great opportunity uh, to be able to meet and learn from not just the PT, but we're also going to meet with members uh, leaders of PSOL, with Brazilian social movements, obviously the labor movement, with the MTST, the homeless workers movement. Uh, learn a little bit about that human rights history. Uh, we're going to do meet with some uh, people who are now activists on, around the issue of uh, truth, memory, and reparations. We're going to visit the Memoria da Resistencia, which is the former prison of the secret police, the DOPS in Sao Paulo. So I think it's going to be, you know, a great experience to take a bunch of uh, leading members of DSA. Uh, uh, some of our members who are have a like hold elected office will also be coming. Uh, and to learn from our colleagues in the global south and also to be able to have a dialogue about that with them about how we as activists in the United States, what we can do to help protect and preserve Brazilian democracy as we go into this electoral season. As you know very well, and many of us know, you know, the US unfortunately played a negative role in the, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Lava Jato uh, operation in terms of getting you know, put it, you know, in terms of the Lula's prison imprisonment, in terms of, you know, obviously Lula not being able to run as a candidate in 2018. And so we feel like we have a, you know, a moral obligation, a political obligation also to work with our, 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 you know, political partners in Brazil to try to ensure that that does not happen again this year. So the president, uh, the outgoing president of the Brazilian uh, electoral uh, court, um, has called on the European Union to send representatives uh, to observe the October 2nd, October 30th elections this year. Is DSA thinking of joining others in being international observers? Probably. I mean, again, DSA, I think our role, you know, we're not impartial election observers, you know, like an organization of American states or et cetera, you know, uh, you know, or the Carter Center, you know, we, you know, the idea is we want to be there on the ground to give political accompaniment to our partners, especially the PT uh, in October during the elections. I, I'm sure we will have some presence during the elections. We're going to be discussing that during our visit. You know, I'm sure that's going to be in conjunction with, uh, you know, other left-wing parties, parties that are part of the Foro de Sao Paulo, uh, because again, we're have, we have a working relationship now with the Foro de Sao Paulo as well. So yeah, we we're, we're definitely understand the importance of being on the ground, just like, you know, and this is something that we've been starting to do as DSA. Last year, we accompanied the Peruvian elections. We accompanied the elections in Chile. We accompanied the Venezuelan municipal elections that were also happening in November. And uh, we also had a, uh, some DSA leaders uh, accompany the first round of the Colombian elections just last month. So that's absolutely something we're gonna be doing. So any other thing that you'd like to share with us about your experiences in Brazil, a message to the listeners uh, of this podcast, this YouTube program? Yeah, that's, <laughs> well, like I said, I think, you know, again, the U.S., uh, for those of us who've been doing, you know, sort of general Latin American solidarity activism for many, many years, you know, it really never ceases to amaze me how much, you know, uh, for good or for bad, the U.S. has such an influence. Even in a country like Brazil, which is, you know, not the same as a Colombia or Guatemala, you know, has a strong economy, has it's, its kind of own, you know, sort of, you know, sub-regional hegemonic, you know, sort of geopolitical power. But, you know, what we can do just by being aware of what's going on in Brazil, you know, being able to mobilize, whether it's, you know, you know, pressing our 
our, our, you know, members of Congress to sign on to a letter, whether it's, you know, participating in a speak out or a protest, uh, you know, I think it's so valuable. It gets, so it's get, gets picked up, as you know, it gets picked up in Brazilian media, you know, the Brazilian community in the United States, which is not small, which is 1.4 million people also, uh, you know, can see that support, you know, uh, so I think it's really important what we do as US-based activists uh, to help protect, uh, uh, you know, what used to be such a vibrant and exciting democracy in a beautiful country with beautiful people. Thank you so much, Jana, for joining us today on Brazil Unfiltered. It's been my pleasure. Thank Mine too, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Uh, Brazil Unfiltered is part of the Democracy Observatory and supported by the Washington Brazil office. If you missed our live broadcast of Dialogues for Democracy in which experts talked about the integrity of the Brazilian elections, you can find the video of the event on this channel. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like the video. And if you have not yet subscribed, please do so. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a five-star review to help other people find the program. Until next time, até a próxima.